today on The Path of Grace. Father, forgive them is probably not the first response that you or I would have when we're right in the heat of the moment of someone hurting us deeply. The first response is probably more like, payback time. Torch them, God. Get them. Blast them. Make them feel what I felt. I want it to be fair. I want them to get what they deserve because of what they've done to me. And that response so often throughout the history of humanity grows. The mindset continues where we begin to obsess maybe over getting some vengeance. Wanting justice. I want them to hurt the way I've hurt. Hmm. Vengeance. Justice. How many movies have you seen where that's the entire plot line? Getting some payback. It may make for a suspenseful movie plot that is entertaining to watch. But for the person seeking the vengeance and committing their life, being out for payback and vengeance, you know what it really does? It puts you in a place of bondage, never being able to move on, never being free. Love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Scripture even tells us to love our enemies. Hmm, so what does love really look like? Well, if you ask three or four different people, you'd probably get three or four different answers. Heck, if you ask 10 different people, you just might get 10 different answers. Someone asked a group of little kids to explain what love is, what it looks like, and each one of them had different answers. Listen closely to what they said. Rebecca, age eight, she said this, when my grandma got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandpa does it for her now, all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Billy, age four, put it this way. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Carrie, age five, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. Chrissy, age six, said this, love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Terry, age four, love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Danny, age seven, love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure the taste is okay. Emily, age eight, love is when you kiss all the time. Then when you get tired of kissing, you still want to be together and you talk more. My mommy and daddy are like that. They look gross when they kiss. Bobby, age seven, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Nika, age six, if you want to learn to love better, you better start with a friend who you hate. Noel, age seven, Love is when you tell a guy that you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. Tommy, age six, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Cindy, age eight, during my piano recital, I was on stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that. I wasn't scared anymore. Claire, age six, my mommy loves me more than anybody. You don't see anyone else kissing me to sleep at night. Elaine, age five. Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Chris, age seven. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Robert Redford. Marianne, age four. Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. Karen, age seven. When you love somebody, your eyelashes go up and down and little stars come out of you. Mark, age six. Love is when mommy sees daddy on the toilet and doesn't think it's gross. Jessica, age eight. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, but if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. I think they had some insight. They had some understanding. What do you think? Maybe you say, yeah, I guess so. But James, didn't you read something right off the bat about loving your enemies? What about that loving your enemies stuff? Are we supposed to go out 
find people who hate us or people who want to hurt us and paint their toenails or splash on some cologne so we smell good around them and give them our french fries along with a kiss? Well, maybe. <laughs> why not? If they can't reach their toes and they need their toenails painted, why not paint them? If they're hungry, how about sharing some fries? Maybe six-year-old Nika had some serious insight when she said, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Hmm. I wonder if the best way to lose an enemy is to try and make them a friend. I wonder if that might be a way to destroy enemies, to try to make them a friend. Now, in our past few studies, we've been doing what I think is some important homework. If you haven't been with us, you can find those earlier studies in the big archive on the Path of Grace website. Just look under December of 2014. The titles are simply Think Different Part 1, Think Different Part 2, and Think Different Part 3. Now, if you've done the homework assignments over the past couple of weeks, you may have begun to experience a shifting in the way you think, a change in the way you see yourself, a change in the way you see other people, a change in the way you see God. And let me tell you, a change of mind for the better is always a good thing. That's what the word repent, by the way, means. It means to have a change of mind for the better. If you haven't done that homework, maybe you should. You might say, come on, seriously, you want me to love my enemies? Don't you know my story? Don't you understand how that person hurt me? Don't you understand what they did to me? Don't you understand what they inflicted upon me? Well, I don't. I haven't lived your life. I haven't experienced what you've experienced. But I do know. As I look at Jesus, as we pointed out over the last couple of weeks, he said some interesting things from the cross. Things he prayed regarding those who had lied about him, plotted against him, beaten him, mocked him, pulled out his beard, nailed him to a couple of pieces of lumber, and then watched him die. Remember what he prayed? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them is probably not the first response that you or I would have when we're right in the heat of the moment of someone hurting us deeply. The first response is probably more like, payback time, torch them, God, get them, blast them, make them feel what I felt. I want it to be fair. I want them to get what they deserve because of what they've done to me. And that response so often throughout the history of humanity grows. The mindset continues where we begin to obsess maybe over getting some vengeance. Wanting justice. I want them to hurt the way I've hurt. Hmm vengeance, justice. How many movies have you seen where that's the entire plot line, getting some payback? It may make for a suspenseful movie plot that is entertaining to watch, but for the person seeking the vengeance and committing their life, being out for payback and vengeance, you know what it really does? Puts you in a place of bondage, never being able to move on never being free. Scripture tells us that we're not to seek vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. Stop looking for payback. If there needs to be some sort of payback, leave it to me. Scripture tells us we're not to return evil for evil. In the law of Moses, there may have been an allowance for an eye for an eye, but I think that was put in there as a limit, not two eyes for an eye. I think God's preference has always been mercy. Paul tells us, to not be overcome with evil, but to overcome evil with good. Micah chapter 6, Micah is speaking on behalf of God to the Israelites. And Micah the prophet asks, God, what do you want from us? Do you want more of those sacrifices? Do you want thousands and thousands of rams? Do you want us to bring 10,000 rivers of oil? What would you like? What's really going to make you happy? How can we really, really serve you, God? And God gave Micah an answer. He said this, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require? Here it is, to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. To do justly, what is that? Well, our traditional view, the Western view for sure, and maybe the worldwide view is justice is giving someone what they deserve. Give them what they deserve. We want justice. Okay. So think about that person that's hurt you. What do they deserve? Well, they deserve to hurt the way I've been hurt. They deserve to feel what I have felt. What they deserve is, hold on. Let me ask you, have you ever hurt anyone? With your words? With your attitude? 
something you did or something you didn't do, intentional or accidental? What do you deserve? Do you want the world or anyone in the world to look at you and say, give them what they deserve? Or would you want something else? Hmm. Scripture also tells us, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Maybe you haven't ever had any serious mess-ups like that person that's hurt you. Maybe you haven't ever hurt anyone. Maybe you've lived a perfect life. I doubt it, though. Let me ask you. If you had been someone who had made some major mistakes or sinned greatly or hurt someone, how would you want others to treat you? Would you want them seeking vengeance? Would you want them looking for payback? Would you want an eye for an eye? Or would you want something else? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Maybe in light of the verse I just shared from Micah, justice isn't supposed to be giving them what they deserve or making them hurt. Just as I've been hurt, that's not what we see in Christ on Calvary. That's not his heart. And again, God told Micah to share with Israel, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Mercy. How do we typically define mercy? Mercy. Not to give someone what they deserve. God doesn't say, love payback, love vengeance, love an eye for an eye. Nope. He says, love mercy. And to walk humbly, to walk in humility, realizing that just as they messed up or just as they were stupid, just as they had sinned, so could you, so could I. In the same way, in the right circumstances. Maybe in light of that full verse from Micah and in light of what we see in Christ on the cross, which we looked at again over the last couple of weeks, we don't see justice as giving others what they deserve. We see mercy doing unto others or treating others as we would want to be treated if the shoe was on the other foot. And I wonder, rather than thinking of justice as treating them just as I have been treated or making them feel just as I felt, it should be doing unto that other person, treating them just as I would want to be treated. Wouldn't that be love? Hmm. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. In Romans chapter 13, Paul gives a short and sweet explanation of love. And I think it applies well to what we're talking about today, especially dealing with those who have hurt us. He says this, love does no harm to its neighbor. Christ tells us to love our neighbors and love our enemies. And Paul tells us, here's what love is. It's not harming another person. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Vengeance is harmful. Payback is harmful. It's hurtful. Love does no harm to its neighbor. We're called to love our neighbor, love our enemies. Paul didn't say, love does no harm to its good neighbor, or love does no harm to its fine, upstanding neighbor, or love does no harm to its neighbor who is always sweet and lovable. Nope. Simply, love does no harm. And that, by the way, was written by a guy who had done a lot of harming earlier in his life but he received mercy. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But right now, first, for some of us who have been hurt, and let me tell you, I'm harping on this over the last couple of weeks because I get a lot of messages from people who have really been hurt and they're holding on, holding on, not wanting to let go of that hurt, wanting some payback, and it's destroying them, keeping them miserable and in bondage. And maybe that's you listening today. You're called to love that person, to be merciful to them. That doesn't mean you're going to necessarily have warm and fuzzy feelings about that person who hurt you. You aren't called right now to, you know, have all this affection toward them and invite them to your house for supper. You know, I'm convinced there are some people in this age that you just aren't going to be on those terms with, and that's okay. But my point is, for your sake, you need to forgive. You need to let go. And by the grace of God, learn to love mercy for the other person. 
just as much as you love mercy for you and as much as I love mercy for me. And in light of all the things we've talked about over the past few weeks, I think that learning to love mercy for the most undeserving person we can imagine is what grace is. And as we extend mercy to people, something else to consider, we have no idea what Father has in store for them and how Father may actually work through them in the future to be a blessing to us. Think about the people in the Bible who we consider to be great men of faith. Have you ever noticed that many of them had some issues? Many of them made serious mistakes along the way. Many had sinned greatly on their path through life. They had hurt and wounded other people. And if they had been given what they deserved as a result of those big mess-ups, they would have never had the opportunity to become who they eventually became, and we would be missing out. Here's just three examples of some guys who made some pretty serious mistakes along the way. Moses, David, and Paul. That's just three. We could come up with more. But they didn't get what they deserved when they had really messed up. Study their lives. You'll find some places along the way where they really did mess up. But they were given mercy. Mercy and grace. And I pray that Father would help us to be dispensers of it because we've been recipients of it. My name is James Flanders. Thank you for listening. Be blessed, my friend. Be blessed.